Did y'all see Melanie Little's meltdown the other day? Boundless millennial too. Apparently I need to talk to my lawyer. The thing about being a civil litigator is this is what I do for them. That's what I do. It's what I live for. So I did talk to my lawyer and he said, as long as what you're saying is the truth, it's not defamation, so. Posting a little video about Melanie Little is a fraud and she's paid by the defense and she's a shill and she's a grifter. That's gonna destroy my professional reputation as an attorney. So all that needs to happen is attorney Melanie Misinformation Little just needs to stop lying and we'll stop calling her a fraud. <clears throat> Deal? So I think um, if you're gonna make those videos about somebody who has no job and doesn't really have anything to lose, you're probably better off. But once you start attacking professional, successful people. And she was a correspondent for Court TV and they stopped asking her on for these reasons, I'm sure. So, I mean, take the constructive criticism. Check your bias. Lee Little was talking about the situation in Aruba. And John came out of the elevator and hugged her. And then Karen said to John, who the F is she? And then he said, oh, that's somebody's sister. And she said, F you to the girl. And the girl said, F you back. And somehow that's a motive for murder too, um, three months before. John was murdered. So-and-so being the girl who invited them all on the vacation together. It was like a group trip of like 50 people and goes F you to the girl. Imagine if you had a significant other that introduced themselves that way to new people. <laughs> like one of these women uh, was in the lobby. And and Melanie Little is trying to normalize that behavior. John came out of the elevator and hugged her. And then Karen said to John, who the F is she? As if that's the behavior of a typical professional woman. Like it's not. So it seems to me that she identifies with Karen. She's a successful professional woman. And I think she might identify with Karen a little bit too much. Someone might wanna check Melanie Little's backyard for some boyfriends, you know? <laughs> and if that was a man acting like that, everyone would be like, you're an abusive relationship. When it comes to men being on the opposite side of abusive relationships, there are certain things that, you know, people don't see it. It's not as apparent to the outside world. It's not even as apparent to the man in the situation because men aren't thinking that way. They aren't thinking that they're being controlled by, you know, people lashing out. He identified it as a toxic behavior. I mean, I think that might have been the turning point in their relationship. So Melanie Little is saying things like, oh, the Dunkin' Donuts coffee that she got the daughter, that's motive for murder. She's saying, you know, she's saying a lot of stuff that is just, no. And Melanie Little should know better. No, that's not the motive for murder, and no one is saying it is. This is breakup violence, and it is a very common thing. Breakup violence is extremely common. So for her to kind of try to mischaracterize these things, and a lot of these things, so her saying F you to the girl in the hallway, her buying the coffee for the daughter at Dunkin' Donuts, we don't know what the situation was, but it seems to me that she was violating John O'Keefe's boundaries with how he wanted to interact with people in the world. Everyone has said he's like the nicest guy and he was amicable and he was like a outgoing guy. So for him to be tied to someone that's gonna meet someone and say, who the F is that, F you? Yeah, that's not a relationship that's gonna work for him, that he's gonna be happy in. So, I mean, obviously he wanted to break off the relationship. And so we're gonna see that you know, he was trying to break it off with her. The kids heard, he tried to get her out of the house. She refused to leave. Um, you know, she was probably holding things over his head. I think we're gonna hear a lot more about it. Um, but then Melanie Little's going on to say, oh, but on that trip to Aruba, she paid for dinner for a party of 10 people. How does she know that? I mean, that sounds like she's talking directly to the defense. Cause what does it matter if she paid for people or not? That's not the issue at hand. Controlling people narcissistic people in relationships would want to pay it's a it's a way to control it's not like oh she's just so kind you know buying people gifts after you've abused them is what narcissists do I'm not saying like i know she's a narcissist but the way that karen's been smiling showing no remorse um the way that she talks about john o'keefe with such disdain in those interviews um she seems kind of, she has narcissistic qualities, we'll say that much. But we'll have to see what attorney Melanie Misinformation Little has to say about this because um, she's lying. In one breath, she's saying, why does this matter? This happened three months before his death. The girl said F you back and somehow that's a motive for murder too. Um, three months before John was murdered. She's talking about the Aruba trip. She knows when it happened because a few minutes later, she says, oh, the Aruba trip 
happened on New Year's Eve. You tell me if you think this is close in time to the murder. It was New Year's Eve. The murder was on January 22nd. So 22 days. Do you think that's close in time to the murder? When she said a few minutes before that it was three months ago, she was lying. That's what a fraud does. When I was in band camp. She's mischaracterizing the Commonwealth's case under the guise that she's giving her legal opinion and pushing a false narrative to deceive people. The fact that Melanie Little's like, oh, and this is all for the O'Keefe family. I pray for the O'Keefe family to get justice. Like, that is fraudulent. You're putting up a front. Let's read the definition of fraud. A person or thing intended to deceive others, typically by unjustifiably claiming or being credited with accomplishments or qualities. Saying that you're an attorney giving your legal analysis, but then going ahead and misconstruing the facts of the case to your audience of however many people you have in your audience, a lot. Yes, that is fraud. Oh, maybe you need to take a refresher course. I know you probably went to school back in the 1900s. Maybe you need to just brush up a little bit. I don't know. Because Yannetti was initially saying um, it was an accident. She loved this man. Yada, yada, yada. And so originally she was charged with manslaughter. But once, you know, a few months later, once they got more information, we don't know what more information that was, whether it was just more information from his phone or what. They all know because they have the grand jury testimony. You know, I think it was that she went back to the body, that there were ring cameras deleted. I mean, those are the big things. So the ring camera shows that there were 15 events. And Yanetti put in a discovery request for the ring cam saying like, we know that there's ring cam footage because we can see the cars in different positions. So like his car parked out where we see it on the video where she's backing up. That's not where his car was to start the night. So I'm thinking that she pulled his car out of the garage and she pulled her car in to hide the damage because she was thinking I'm gonna get in trouble for DUI. She hit him with the car. She had to have known because you know that car is gonna be beeping telling you there's something wrong with your taillight, right? So she put her car in there and then started calling him. And you know, at some point she went back there, went back to the house panicking and started calling like Jen McCabe and Carrie to round up like the search party to go find his body. I'm very surprised that the ring cam wasn't able to be recovered, um, that it was like a hard delete like that. So it's strange, but I think, you know, even if we see, even if there's ring cam showing that prior to she left, that his car was in the garage and then it's out, knowing that, you know, he never came home, um, it's gonna be like, well, why did you move the cars around? I mean, they can't ask her that because she's not going to testify, but it's suspicious. And so here's the thing. The defense has been putting out all these like theories since July. And I just posted a video from July when I believed the conspiracy theory because the information that I had at the time, um, I just believed because I didn't see all this other information. Now, the other information that I'm talking about has come out since then. Everything that's come out since then has completely blown up that original theory and people are still sticking with that original theory. Like the dog bites. We only had that one picture in court of his arm and it was like kind of far away, it was dark, it looked steeper. But since then we have seen better photos and you can see that it's abrasions because you can see like the skin is not like a, a clean slice. It's it's like jagged, so it's it's from impact. Like it's clear. John Scott Morgan said it on the Melanie Little show the other night. She still tried to argue that it was dog bites, even though you can clearly see. I don't know. I don't know why she's trying to push that agenda. Are they still going to try to say it's dog bites? Like his shirt would have been sliced up too if it was a dog, or the shirt would have been ripped off. The sleeve would have been ripped off um, because the dog's not going to let go. But like we don't know what the clothes looked like. I think we might hear about that a little bit, um, and then. There was no dog saliva or any dog DNA found on his clothing, which would have been there. There was no hair, no saliva, nothing. What was found in his clothing were taillight fragments from the explosion of the light. That was a big one. Another big one since then that's come out is actual Rick Green's report. Rick Green is the defense's expert, but his report itself says that he didn't arrive until after climbing those flights of stairs. But the defense went out in a motion hearing, in a Rule 17 hearing, and said it's definite that he was inside the house because he was going up and down the stairs. 
but the GPS coordinates show that he didn't get to the house until after said stairs were climbed. So, and that's just their own expert. And so then the Commonwealth comes out and they plotted his GPS coordinates to show that, you know, he never went inside the house. He stopped moving at 1231 and they used, um, I can't think of the name of the app, but it's basically a search and rescue app. And I'm thinking because this is a hilly area, that's why they chose to use that version. His phone never moved after 1231. Um, a lot of people are trying to say, well, the freezing cold, the phone would have not still been working by the morning. But that's not true. If it was under his body, his body heat would have been keeping it warm enough for it to continue to work. Like if I leave my phone in the car when it's freezing out, it it's slow, but it like comes alive as soon as you warm it up. So like... Yeah, it, I mean, it might have still been warm enough. As soon as someone got it in their hand and warmed it up, it would come back alive, even if it was so cold. So, I mean, I don't think that's, I don't think that's like a big thing either way. Oh, in the opening statements, like really, what was she doing between those hours of 12.31 or 12.41 and 4.53? Because we only know about those because those were in the probable cause. And those were gathered not from her phone data, but from John O'Keefe's phone data, Carrie's phone data, and Jen McCabe's phone data. They did not have her phone data yet. So there's about four hours of time where she said she was sleeping and then she woke up and he wasn't there. But there's four hours there where, you know, was she sleeping? Was her phone inactive that whole time? Did her phone go in airplane mode? Did her phone shut off at any point in time? Um, was she calling people? Was she Googling things? I mean, all of that is gonna be very telling because if she was calling people in the middle of the night before Carrie and Jen, if she was Googling weird things. Read. Um, the Commonwealth alleges that on the morning of January 29th, 2022, at approximately 6.04 a.m., the Canton Police Department received a 911 call reporting an unresponsive male party in the snow outside a residence at 34 Fairview Road within their town. Officers responded and discovered the male party, later identified as John O'Keefe, off the roadway in the front lawn area. Officers identified three women with Mr. O'Keefe, one of whom was the defendant, Karen Reed, the girlfriend of Mr. O'Keefe. The defendant had been with Mr. O'Keefe the previous evening at two different bars in Canton and had driven with him to his residence in the early morning hours of this date. Mr. O'Keefe was treated by paramedics from the Canton Fire Department and transported to the Good Samaritan Medical Center where he was later pronounced deceased. The Commonwealth alleges that the defendant struck Mr. O'Keefe with her vehicle earlier that morning and then left the scene while Mr. O'Keefe lay injured in the snow during a blizzard. The defendant denies that she has committed these or any crimes alleged in this case and she has pled not guilty. So the defendant is charged, as you've heard, with second degree murder and also charged with manslaughter while operating under the influence and leaving the scene after causing personal injury or death. I will describe these crimes in detail at the end of the case when I teach the jury the law, but briefly, murder is the unlawful killing of a human being. In order to prove the defendant guilty of second degree murder, the Commonwealth must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed an unlawful killing and that it was done with malice. In comparison, involuntary slaughter is an unintentional, unlawful killing caused by wanton or reckless conduct. These terms and the elements of the crimes will be explained to you in detail at the end of the case before you begin your deliberations. Now, at the outset, I would like to address the issue of public interest in this case and the duty of this court to adhere to the rule of law. John Adams said that we are a government of laws, not of men, and that the law must be deaf to the clamoring of the public. He meant that while public opinion about a given subject may ebb and flow, the law must be steady, reliable, and even-handed. We know that in the subject of this case, there are people advocating for one outcome or another with intensity, but without the benefit of having heard or seen any evidence at all. The law works in a different way, and the difference is crucial to our system of justice. 
The jurors selected for this trial will hear and judge the evidence. They will decide what the facts are and where the evidence is contested, they will determine where the truth lies. Ultimately, the jury will decide whether the Commonwealth has carried its burden of proving that the defendant is guilty of any crime beyond a reasonable doubt and to a moral certainty. People outside of this building have rights and we know that they have voices, but this criminal trial will be decided by an independent jury, free from outside interference, based only upon the evidence presented in this courtroom and the law. This is the only way to ensure that every person who comes before the court receives a fair trial. It is just that simple and that important. So, while public comment will likely continue, the rule of law will be upheld.